So you might notice this is a little bit different format than what we've had throughout the rest of the conference. And we wanted to kind of have a little bit more of an exchange between us around kind of some of the ideas that, um, you know, were shaping the, the world at that time and kind of translate that into how it is affecting us all now. So I guess my first question for you, Leonard, is that, you know, with the, the Commodore PET, which you worked on uh, extensively, and then later the VIC-20 and the C64, and then later with Atari, you know, there was this huge explosion in the number of computers um, in the hands of people. And that was really, you know, your father's stated goal was how do we get this into as many hands as possible? What effect do you think that had on that generation? Well, it started an awful lot of careers. Um, I can't imagine the number of people that have come up to me when they see my last name um, and go, you started my career. Uh, you gave me what became my life, which is kind of a weird experience. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it, uh, there's no question that personal computers would have happened without us, uh, but I don't think there's any question that there would have been a lot fewer people with them uh, as early as there were. Right, right. And I guess, you know, for folks that don't know, I mean, one of the key developments was the creation of the 6502 microprocessor. And if you didn't know, the 6502 was what powered the Apple II, the Commodore 64, the Atari 8-bit computers, and a handful of others. Yeah, including the Nintendo Entertainment System. Right, exactly. So it, virtually everything at the time right. ran off of this one chip. And I guess the interesting thing, too, is that your father acquired the company that created the 6502. Right. Mostech. So, uh, you know, that gave them, I guess, a tremendous edge in terms of being able to pump out these chips and get them to a tremendous number of people. Yeah, and it was completely accidental. Um, the, uh, so MOS Technology uh, made a couple of things at the time. They, uh, my dad bought them because they produced calculator chips. And there was a, uh, an interesting shakeout in the, in the industry. Um, Texas Instrument supplied the calculator chips for virtually every calculator uh, that was sold in the U.S. Um, I don't think anyone out there probably remembers the Bomar brain. Uh, the first uh, I see one hand, probably more. I uh, used to work there. Excellent. The, uh, um, so an incredibly successful line of, of calculators. And then uh, Texas Instrument changed the pricing, drove Bomar almost instantly out of business. Mm. Um, my father, who was a Holocaust survivor, uh, tells the story, or told the story, that um, he wasn't so ready to die yet. Uh, so he found a company that made uh, calculator chips and bought it. And they also had this microprocessor. And the guy that designed that wanted to make personal computers. So yeah, what a, you know, a total coincidence in a meeting of the mind. So that would have been Chuck Peddle, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So you know, here you have this processor that uh, for its day was an incredibly advanced processor compared to say the Z80 and you know, in terms of like the amount of raw power sort of packed into a small die, I guess. The, you know. the, uh, the power per dollar right. is yeah. where it absolutely excelled. And they were selling them for what, like $20, $25, something like that uh, yeah. to like hobbyists and stuff. And so this was incredible, the notion that you could suddenly get a computer chip that would you know, enable you to build effectively a whole home computer from mostly one chip. It's, right. it's pretty incredible. So that was what inspired Steve Wozniak and, um, you know, the other creators of these 6502 based machines to, you know, really see that there was a possibility of getting it into the hands of, of a lot of people. Yeah. So tell me, you know, you were trained in astrophysics, but also have this incredible affinity for computing and computers. And you know, you seem also to be really driven to, you know, educate people about science and critical thinking. How do you see all those things as interrelated? Um, well, computers are the, the tools of science. Uh, it's really hard to, uh, to get a degree in science these days or even back in the, in the ancient past when I did uh, without doing a lot of computer work. Uh, so those are, are intimately connected. And then... Um, as Carl Sagan said, we have a culture that is exquisitely based on science and technology and a populace that knows almost nothing about science and technology. <laughs> and um, I think he said something along the lines of, we might survive that way for a while, but the combustible mixture of power and ignorance will blow up in our faces. Yeah, I think 
that's kind of a description of 2016, uh, you know. It's <laughs> uh, it, it, it may be. Uh, I'm not sure if that was what he had in mind, but... We're, we're getting there, if not... We're, you know, we're getting there. <laughs> um, so, a question that, that we had discussed uh, earlier, and I think the audience would like to hear about, is the idea of should everyone learn to code? That certainly is something that we keep hearing right now. It's learn to code, learn to code. Um, what do you think? That's an easy one. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's <laughs> the, I think the world would be an enormously better place if everyone had the um, humbling psychological experience of trying to make a computer do exactly what the heck you want it to do, because <laughs> they're incredibly literal, and unless you have very carefully thought things through, it's not going to work. Um, and that's a, it's a wonderful intellectual exercise, and, and it would be good if, if people had that. Um, but I don't know if that's possible. I don't know what percentage of people will actually get there. Um, at some level, I think it should be done like art and music education was, used to be done. Uh, people didn't go to art class because they were going to become artists. They went because they were going to be uh, knowledgeable about what art was and why it was important and what art could do for culture. Uh, at some level, I think we should teach not only computers but math and science that way. Right. So people actually understand why math and science are beautiful right. and why they're useful as opposed to how many loops in a block and tackle it takes to lift a certain number of pounds, uh, which isn't always that fun. Yeah, and uh, we were talking uh, too about the idea of appreciating beauty and the idea of like appreciating a beautiful mathematical proof and yeah. how that seems to be something that's lost on a big chunk of the culture. Yeah, I, at some level, I think it's because uh, the first introduction most people get to math um, is unavoidably in elementary school, and very few elementary school teachers are math experts, right. and they don't feel the, uh, as uh, Bertrand Russell called it, the cold, austere beauty of mathematics. Right, so uh, they so themselves can't kind of convey it. The cold, austere beauty of mathematics is not a joke. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing, and it's a, I, I can't tell why you're laughing, but <laughs> the, uh, um, but if you could, I'm sure that as a, a percentage of you that are nodding your head and going, yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, and there's another almost certainly larger percentage going, what is he talking about? Um, but there's, there's something there that uh, would make everyone's life better. Right, right. Now, you were a uh, peer of Steve Jobs. You knew Steve. I wondered if you had a favorite Steve story. First time I met him was at a, uh, at a pool party at Chuck Peddle's house. Um, and um, Steve had arrived on his brand new BMW motorcycle, and all he would talk about was the elegance of BMW shaft drive motorcycles as opposed to everyone else's ridiculous chain drive. Um, and the, the drive he had, uh, no pun intended, uh, for elegance and how design needs to be beautiful and functional and maximize those two together right. uh, seemed to be something that really drove him. Well, and we certainly yeah, saw that later on and, and the idea of something precision milled seems very Steve, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so I'm gonna bring up a anecdote from the fall of 1990. Um, so we're gonna go back in time. I had written a piece um, about an ST book, which was a laptop that you guys had designed and I was lamenting the omission of a floppy disk drive in this machine, because at that time, to me, then, it seemed very important. And you called me up <laughs> on the phone and said, what are you doing? You don't know what you're talking about. This thing doesn't need a disk drive. Do you remember this at all? Uh, no. Okay, that was, that was gonna be my bet, and that's why I saved yeah. it till now. I'm, you know? I'm, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> it's quite all right. You were right. I mean, looking back on it, I mean, come on. You know, we see now with the removal of the headphone jack and everything, you know. like Which clearly, also didn't go over well. No, it didn't go over well. But I suspect that, you know, looking back on it in a few years, we're not going to worry too much about that. So right. I guess it's interesting, like, looking back on that kind of an incident. It's funny now, like, you know, to have you call me up. Because at the time, I think I was all of 21. And, um, uh, you know, like... It's interesting, you know, we, we sometimes lament, you know, like, oh, these changes in technology and why are they taking out these features? But it does move forward and sometimes yep. the right answer is to take stuff out. So simplicity can be good. Yes, exactly. Now on that score, I have to ask you, you know, back in the day, the big question was Commodore, Atari, you know, Amiga, you know, whatever, iPhone or Android? <laughs> um, I will feign, uh, I will plead ignorance. Um, I don't know enough about the Android. My, uh, my older son is um, a technology junkie. I have no idea where he would have gotten that propensity. <laughs> um, but he has had an iPhone from I, maybe the first model as soon as they came out. Mm -hmm. um, so I get his hand-me-downs. Oh, I see how this works. Uh, so <laughs> so you, you, get a, you just get whatever gets handed I, to I, you. Yeah. I always have you know, one or two generations um, back. Okay, so on. you know, I've got the seven plus. I'm thinking you've got maybe a six. I've got a six. Yeah, there we uh, go. Is it, <laughs> or is six it a, plus, maybe. <laughs> it may, I, it's a six. Yeah. Yeah, there it's, we go. Yeah, so, so uh, same size. Better but, camera, yeah. though, here. So yeah. It's, but, no, but note the no <laughs> headphone jack, so. You know. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know enough about the Android. Uh, everything I, I know it says it's a, they're great phones, but I, I don't have any personal experience. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, it's, for those that don't know, I started a computer sales company as a teenager, and I actually sold computers manufactured by uh, the Trammell family for many years um, and went on to you know, be one of the larger Atari dealers in the United States in the early 90s. So this is kind of all coming full, full circle for me, and we were excited to be able to bring Leonard here. So my final question for you is, are you optimistic about society's to kind of ability to, to increase its ability for critical thinking? It seems like that's something that is maybe missing right now, and what do you think? Yeah, if, if you look at a lot of the talks that we've heard over the last day and a half, um, many of those problems are the result of insufficient critical thinking. Uh, understanding why it is people make mistakes, understanding what it is about the way human cognition works. Um, I th I'm, I'm optimistic uh, because I'm involved in trying to fix that. Uh, there are a couple of organizations that I'm involved with that actually uh, actively promote these things. Um, and if we don't get it right, we're all dead anyway. So. Um, right. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, it'll, yeah. It'll, it'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, you know, hopefully we manage to heal ourselves with this problem. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming. Um, if, if you want to check out the film, uh, I believe the website is 8bitgeneration.com. I believe that is correct. And yeah. uh, there's a Kickstarter for some other films in the series. And, you know, check it all out. It's worth educating yourself on the subject. Um, I think, you know, with all the things going on with Raspberry Pi and whatnot right now, we're kind of going through another wave of this, but it's a little different. So, um, you know, check that stuff out and, and uh, learn what, what this man's incredible family has accomplished. It's worth, worth learning about. So, thank you. Again, thank you, Leonard. You're very welcome.